This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation tonight about how we work with difficult emotions. Uh, my name is Khaled Latif. I am the university chaplain at New York University and the executive director of the Islamic Center at NYU. Uh, we're really excited tonight to be joined by my good friend and colleague, Yael Shai, uh, who's going to introduce herself in a minute. Just to give you a quick rundown, the program's going to probably go for about an hour or so. Uh, if you have any comments, thoughts, feel free to jot them down. Uh, we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A, um, as well as if you're on Zoom, uh, feel free to put them either in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and we'll get to them as well. Um, so, Yael, feel free, take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves and uh, yourself and the topic, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, and I unmute on both. Or, uh, Unmute on just, uh, okay, how is this? Oh, am I echoing or is everything okay? Amazing, okay. Um, it's so good to be here. It is such an honor. Um, this community is one I have admired and been just so fortunate to be around thanks to my friendship with you, um, Khalid. And, um, I am just really excited to get into this topic. I think it is probably like my favorite thing to talk about. And I know some of our students are here from the course that we co-teach called What Really Matters, Leadership with No Regrets. And we do an entire section on um, working with emotions. How do we um, manage these visitors that kind of come and are and overtake us and often produce like so much suffering. And I know for me, um, the real crux of that, the place where I suffered the absolute most was when I was in college. And it's not like I don't ever suffer now, but I think that the reason why I love working at NYU, I'm supposed to introduce myself. <laughs> I think I used to work at NYU uh, full time as the uh, director of the Spiritual Life Center and the founder of Mindful NYU, um, which is an, an incredible program that anybody at NYU should check out, and as well as the Spiritual Life Center. Um, but um, about a year ago, I started my own company called Mindfulness Consulting, where I um, teach classes and I run group coaching programs, which I'll talk about a little bit later because um, my newest one just launched. And I, um, yeah, I consult on, on bringing mindfulness into people's lives and into people's organizations. And I fortunately still get to teach this class with um, the Imam. And so I still get to stay connected to NYU. And that I feel like is one of the greatest gifts of my life um, and one of the greatest pleasures of my life. So that's what I'm doing here. Great. Um, so you all can bear with us. We're gonna be muting on and off on different apparatus, but I think by the end of it, we're gonna get the hang of it. Uh, and so just to kind of get into the crux of the conversation, a lot of what we're looking at today necessitates first having a baseline definition of terminologies, right? Emotions are an integral part to any of our existence. For anybody to claim that they're not emotional uh, would essentially mean that they're not human, right? We're all built with emotions. We have them as a key part to who it is that we are. Now, the challenge that comes up for a lot of us when we're thinking about coping and thriving and even understanding that through the prism of difficult emotions is being able to first recognize what all the emotions are that we're able to experience. In the course that Yael and I co-teach at NYU, uh, as well as I think just in our interactions with people through 
our respective careers, there's so much that gives indication that there's a real absence of just language and terminology that becomes a key sticking point in now mislabeling what I'm feeling. And it creates this domino effect. In the last week alone, no exaggeration, there's been at least two couples and four individuals that I've spoken to who are just at their wits end in terms of trying to figure out how to manage things between themselves, trying to figure out how to manage their own emotions. And a lot of what the challenge is, is that they keep repeating to themselves again and again, again, that I am angry, I am upset, I am this, I am that, or you are this, you are that. And you can convince yourself of anything if you hear it enough times over and over, right? Like if all of you, before the time you got onto this Zoom and the time we started advertising it, said to yourselves 10, 20 times a day, call the stupid, call the stupid, call the stupid. Regardless of anything that came out of my mouth, you'd be like, man, this guy is so stupid because the self-talk will have created now an overwhelming prism through which you're synthesizing information and affirming that self-talk through how you perceive reality. And so step number one here is to just be able to think out before we go to name how did I even learn how to name emotions in the first place? And that's not meant to be a rhetorical question, but to dig deep and to think really creatively and introspectively because terminology has become really, really important. We teach our students that there's about 31,000 emotions that you can feel, but so many of us are limited to just a handful but every time I feel something, it's not simply sadness. It's not simply anger. It's not simply just one of the basic feelings that are there. And in order for me to start to harness this strategically, both for my own sake, as well as for the sake of others, I have to take some time to just reflect first. The state of my relationship to my emotional self how it is that I've been socialized with certain perceptions, both of just emotions in general, but what I understand of me. And the second thing that I'll say here before I pass it to Yael is a critical part in all of this is going to be that your emotional expressions are heavily attached to what we call core beliefs, right? All of us function cognitively in a similar way. In spiritual traditions, you might add in an organ of cognition that's not simply just your mind, but you also refer to your heart, your spirit, as having mechanisms of cognition. But fundamentally, the cognitive practice is still rooted in this as an idea. And a core belief is not something that's abstract theology. It's not something you rotely memorize or somebody teaches you in that way, but it's subjective, individual to you. And it's nurtured and cultivated through your own socialization, how you've been brought up, the experiences that you've had, as well as major events that might impact you, traumatic experiences, other types of experiences that now create within you a set of beliefs that can be categorically positive or negative, but they can be acted upon in an unconscious mode and impact now both how you perceive reality, but also how it is that you express things, things that come from you. So examples of positive core beliefs are, I am worthy of love or I'm unworthy of love is a negative, it's opposite. A positive, I'm worthy of success. A negative, I'm unworthy of success. The quintessential example that is utilized to identify this is the example of a circus elephant. That as a baby elephant, it gets tied up, it learns helplessness, and it's tamed in this way. And now as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, it's a massive creature, but it's essentially now tied by the same rope as it was when it was a child. And from the outside looking in, one would just simply say, well, break the rope. 
but it's not a physical shackling that it's going through. It's a psychological shackling. It's in a space where its socialization has taught it to perceive reality in this way. And this now brings me to an anecdote that I want to end with, where I had a student of mine who came to see me years ago and was in a space where somebody had told him that whenever he had a question about life, he had doubts. He was trying to figure out just how to navigate his existence in this world. The adults in his life would constantly tell him that you're not supposed to ask these kinds of questions. And when you ask these questions, it's a sign of ingratitude. It means you're being ungrateful. And then Islam as a religion, ingratitude is not seen as something that one wants to aspire towards. And if somebody tells you you're an ingrate, they're basically saying to you that you're not happy with what God has given to you. And so from the time this kid is really young through most of his teens, any questions, any situation, you know, we don't do this. And it wasn't even always in a yelling format, which makes it that much harder when someone calmly is telling you, hey, this means you're ungrateful. And he hears it again and again and again and again. And now he's sitting talking to me. It's about two o'clock in the morning and we're on a Zoom call. And we're having a basic conversation. He's a grown man at this point. And as we're discussing just his own kind of exhaustion in life, and he doesn't understand why he snaps at people and people don't get along with him. And he feels so self-deprecating and just the way he perceives himself. We get to this place where he starts to talk to me about this idea of gratitude and his relationship to it. And in the midst of the conversation, not as kind of a, you know, passing thought, but something that wasn't, to my mind, a big part of it. But I just said to him, having questions is not a sign of ingratitude. Having questions is a sign of curiosity. That's how you grow. And I continued to talk because like a lot of you know, I talk a lot and I kept going, but he had paused. And then while I was speaking, he started to talk in the middle of it. And I caught myself and he said, are you telling me that I'm not ungrateful because of this? I said, no, man, you're not. And now it's like almost three in the morning. And for the next 10, 20 minutes, he's just crying, letting out all of this like confusion, frustration, everything, because no one had ever said to him anything that countered now what was building itself up as a core belief within him, that this notion of I am ungrateful became now I'm somehow inadequate, I am deficient, I am lacking. And think now if that's your core system, conscious or unconscious, and you now have difficulty in life, you have hardship in life, you have an argument with a friend, you have a challenge with a loved one, something comes up, but your internal cognitive mode is constantly rooted in self-hate, self-loathing, self-deprecation, you're going to then process difficult emotions with these outbursts and this anger and this frustration and all of these different things that are going to perpetuate now that much more of self-dislike because you're going to see yourself and you're going to affirm those things again, saying, look at how miserable I am. I just fight with everybody. Look at how miserable I am. I just push everybody away. And it's affirming that feeling of inadequacy, that feeling that I don't really have a space where I'm supposed to be. And it just kind of doubles down. And I want you to just take this as a principle, right? Again, to just summate. Naming the emotions is important, right? The emotions are not good or bad. If you are a religious person, spiritual person, the emotions were given to us for a reason, right? Understanding how we respond to them can be something that's categorically good or bad, but fundamentally what they are are data points. And you want to start to break some of this down 
to see what is it rooted in so that now I can take the difficulty of certain experiences and still harness them to cope and thrive as we're seeking to discuss tonight. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back to Yael. I'd love to hear what you think on some of this and adding to it in your own experiences. And I'm going to mute myself really quickly so that we don't echo, but go for it. So thank you for, for kind of starting us off that way. And, uh, and I think that that story, at least for me, like resonated very deep. And one of the things I, I love the most about the process of meditation, people think about it like, oh, it's a nice way to kind of calm down. And for some people it is, but for me, it was never, um, that was never like, especially in the beginning when I first started meditating, how I felt, I felt like when I actually quieted down, I didn't feel calm everything from under the surface kind of started had this chance to come up and it actually felt sometimes very painful or hard but a different kind of pain there's um, a brilliant social worker author named resma menikin who talks about the difference between clean pain and dirty pain and he says that clean pain is when there is a channel like an opening to acknowledge the truth of what you've been carrying around and it hurts but it hurts in a different way in a more clean way in a way that where it's the body's processing and working through what's coming up versus dirty pain which is a, the a kind of pain of shoving down and of repressing and of fighting the truth of how things are. And he talks about it in terms of um, racial trauma, but also just pain and trauma in general. When we shove things down, it causes real damage physically, emotionally, spiritually, politically, <laughs> all sorts of ways. And so this is a serious thing that I think you're pointing to that you kind of start us up with, that this is, this is like sacred, powerful, important work of being able to begin to open up to what is true and what is not true of the stories. And then what is true in our bodies, what is happening when we're feeling something. And sometimes I think depending on how you're socialized, that's going to take different forms. I wanted to share a very short little snippet from a really beautiful book called Radical Compassion by Tara Brack. She's a phenomenal uh, meditation teacher. And this is just a short little part. In a distant land, world word spread far and wide of a holy man with magic so powerful it could relieve the most severe suffering. But to reach his wilderness refuge and receive his healing, a seeker had to trek through dense forests and over precarious mountain passes. Those who persevered arrived at the holy man's simple hut, exhausted and dirty. After guiding them to a refreshing stream and offering tea, he would sit with them in silence, gazing out at the sky. When he finally spoke, it was to swear them to secrecy about what was next to pass between them. Once they promised, the holy man asked a simple question. What are you unwilling to feel? what are you unwilling to feel and that is the 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 magic really that kind of un, uh, began to unravel the suffering and i think what we normally do with painful difficult emotions are one of two things either we act out on them like they they trigger us oftentimes it's like anger or um trying to think of another one, anxiety, where we immediately, as soon as we feel it, we try and, we're trying to get it out of us. And so we either yell at someone or snap at someone or um, do something we shouldn't to try and shove, shove that feeling down. Um, the other way is to actually try and shove that feeling down. And this isn't like logical. This isn't a decision we make. It's oftentimes rooted, as you said, in how we were raised, in stories that got told to us, 
oftentimes in, in the culture. And so when we shove that down, that is what I'm saying causes, it can cause depression, it can cause addictions, it can cause all kinds of trouble for us. So we don't want to be reacting the second we're triggered and we don't want to be shoving down. So what do we do? And the path that um, I'm going to suggest here today, this exercise that I'm hoping we can kind of try together is an exact pathway to a third path that is about processing, that is about kind of letting that feeling make its way from dirty the dirty place to the clean place so that it can be moved and felt through us. So um, I don't know if we're ready for it yet or if we wanna jump right in to this, this little um, exercise. Shall we go for it? Okay. So um, maybe uh, Hannah and the chat if it's not too much while I'm talking because it's an acronym that we're going to use and so maybe we can kind of report as I say it so that those who are more visual learners can actually see it in front of you this acronym I didn't make up um, it was made up by a Buddhist teacher named Michelle McDonald and then publicized oh smart on those transcriptions <laughs> so um, on the zoom we're getting some transcriptions but hopefully those of you in instagram and facebook land can um, follow along and the acronym is called rain and we're i'm, I'm going to take us through each one of the letters and exactly how we are going to do this process and then we're going to do it and then uh, maybe we'll get any of your thoughts, uh, Khaled, and then we'll maybe open it up to questions. So uh, the acronym starts with R for recognize. And this is what you were just talking about, Khaled, about naming the feeling, recognizing it's there because we can't begin to deal with anything internal or external if we're pretending it's not there. That's that question. What are you unwilling to feel? So it's brave sometimes to really recognize we're feeling something. Loneliness, anxiety, um, overwhelm, anger, all of these, nothing we feel is bad. You said this too, like no feeling is bad because if it was bad, we wouldn't have it. It's there for a reason. It got created in us for a reason and to just begin to name it and say it's here is our first step. And I actually saw today on Instagram, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if any of you out there speak Irish, the original Irish, but apparently in Irish, um, people don't say I'm angry or I'm sad. They say anger is on me, upon me, uh, or sadness is upon me. And I love that because as you're saying, like when we get so we're, we live inside of language. And so when we live inside of, of saying like, I'm angry, then we are anger. It's we think of it like it's every part of us. Whereas if anger is upon us or anger is present, maybe there's other things that are present. Maybe it's going to stay for a little while and maybe it's going to leave later on. And so to just kind of like speak to that moment, like this in this moment, this is what's here. And I like to think of it as like kind of taking attendance, like who's here? Let's like name the feelings that are here that are present. And if you want to play along today, um, we're going to maybe if you want to put in the chat, what's here for you right now? If you're either on Facebook or Instagram or on the Zoom, like what's present for you right now? And feel free to pop that in there. I think they might only go to us, but um, but I can read them out as I see them. So that's the R for recognize. The A for uh, is for allow. So it's one thing to say like, okay, anger is here, anxiety is here. The next step is that question, what am I unwilling to feel? So in that step there's a resistance to the feeling because it's unpleasant we don't want to feel it and so it's just a sort of movement that we try and make to say all right it's here that's it 
it's here. Can I allow it to be here? Doesn't mean I have to like it. It doesn't mean I have to like wallow in it forever, but it's a kind of an action that I'm going to lay down my weapons. I'm not going to fight this feeling for this moment. I'm going to just say, yep, it's here. Can I soften? Can I open to it? Can I allow it to be here? Um, the next part is I, and this is where we have a little bit of inquiry. So, um, thank you for those that are dropping in their, what they're feeling, stress, doubt, sadness. Somebody asked, is shame an emotion? Absolutely. It's an emotion. Anger, impatience, anxiety, overwhelm, tiredness. Yes. These are all real. And so as you name it, can you just as best as you can relax around it? Can you allow it to be here? Can you say, welcome, you know, I'm not happy that this is what I'm feeling, but this is what I'm feeling. Can we just soften and allow it to be here? Um, just a side note, this is also, this also really helps when we're talking about physical pain for any of you who experience physical pain, either regularly, or sometimes I get migraines and in those moments of real terrible migraine pain, or when I was in childbirth, <laughs> when there's nothing you can do, the pain is not stopping and it's just present and it's there and you've named it, the best thing you can possibly do is to not fight it. It doesn't mean it will make it go away, but it means that you're not adding an extra layer of suffering on top of that original painful feeling. So as best as you can, it's like a physical softening, it's an emotional softening and allowing. Okay, back to the eye. Then we're talking about um, inquiry. So this is what Khalid was talking about when we start to begin to unravel, well, what's going on here? What's at the root of this feeling? And sometimes you have no idea, that's okay. But sometimes you can be like, well, yeah, I think at the root of this, underneath this anger, I feel really sad or I feel really hurt. At the root of this loneliness, when I when I kind of dig underneath it, I feel like a lot of longing. I, I really want someone or people or friends. And so it's a question of trying to see what's happening underneath, whether that's the feeling that's underneath or maybe with a friend or a chaplain or someone who you're a therapist, you can also begin to get at the core stories underneath that are churning out these difficult emotions because the core story is not true or it's old or it came from outside of you. It came from the world and it is not authentic or true. And that action of just unveiling it can sometimes weaken it and can help us to begin to strengthen um, growth mindsets and uh, strengths that we have so that we're not living only from those painful core stories. The last piece, the N, is for nourish. And this part just kind of asks the question when you're feeling horrible or you're feeling overwhelmed or lonely or angry, it can be a lot. And we wanna to bring to all of this work that we're doing of recognizing, allowing and inquiring, we wanna bring some kindness, some care to ourselves, whether that's just the way we speak to ourselves, to just be like, and I do this, like to just be like, oh, this is so hard, poor baby, actually, I was dealing with like a moment of real sadness this morning. I don't know if I should share this because it's so ridiculous, but I'll share it. Because um, I was dropping my sons off at work. I have a, a five-year-old and a four-year-old. And the five-year-old told me, I don't want you to kiss me anymore when you say goodbye. And I always like kiss them at the door. And I was like, not kissing at all like ever, like even on your head. And he was like, no, I don't want you to kiss me anymore. And then he just ran into the room and I got back into the car and I just 
sobbing. I felt so sad. I felt so heartbroken. I was just like, I was un, like I was gone. <laughs> and I actually texted to myself, like first I just like felt it. I tried to follow these steps. And then I texted to myself, like, this is a moment in time. You're gonna be okay. I love you to myself. <laughs> And that's that in, that nourish, like how can, what can you do for yourself when you're having a hard time? How can you take care of yourself? And so I sent myself that text. I had some water. I called my husband who told me I was being ridiculous, <laughs> you know, in a good way, in a nice way. And, um, and that was my nourish. So it's not like it's a linear process. It's not like we inquire, we find out, and then we're done and we move to the end. All, these are all steps of a process, but they work together to ask, to, to kind of work through this emotion, to let it process and move through. Um, so I'm seeing some of your wonderful comments, how we speak to ourselves matters, absolutely. Um, and, also, yeah, to help us to not run from the feeling. Absolutely. So thank you for those beautiful comments. Um, <laughs> thank you for those of you that are identifying with my mother grief. Um, and I want to just give a moment to you, um, Khaled, if you want to respond or any thoughts that you have before we maybe go into the meditation. Yeah, I, I mean, I think all of it, I think resonates so deeply and uh you know maybe you can give some insight for those who one have not engaged in kind of meditative or contemplative practice um and two you know how how might somebody begin to make themselves vulnerable right because there's a lot of elements that as you're unpeeling layers of self-awareness uh some things that pop up, they might be very easy to digest and deal with. And some things that pop up, they might be quite hard to confront. Um, and so is it better for me to do this on my own if I've not done it before? Should I engage in some kind of objective space of self-expression, uh, whether that's writing in a notebook or speaking to a counselor or finding a friend or a colleague? of some kind to, to but what would my starting points be in that regard? And as things come up, if something seems too hard for me to handle, you know, what, what would I do then? Maybe you could offer some insight on that. Absolutely. Um, and somebody wrote so far, it's recognize, allow, and remember it's rain is the acronym. And so the one that you're missing on Instagram is, um, inquire that's that asking the question what's underneath what is this about and just kind of looking in your body for what might be that answer not trying to think your way out of it but to try and see where is the answer in your body there's kind of knowledge that and and wisdom that comes through the body and so that's what that eye is for so that's that to your question um Khalid, there is some Absolutely, there's some, especially emotions and trauma, like real trauma, that it's you're you might be stopping yourself from feeling, or you might feel kind of creeping up on you that you're like, uh, actually, I am unwilling to feel that, and that might be wise. We don't want to do something you by yourself or with somebody who maybe isn't trained in how to work with things that are overwhelming or that are traumatic or bring up trauma um, without support. And so for things that feel like they might touch on those pieces, I'd really recommend doing that with somebody who is trained, whether it's a trained spiritual leader or a counselor or therapist, um, because it can actually be harmful to you to, to be alone and not have someone to help anchor you in that process. For things that feel like they maybe are not at that level, for things that don't make you start to feel like you're losing it or feeling overwhelmed, um, some trauma-informed meditation teacher um, 
rooted in a, an approach called um, mindfulness-based trauma work. They call about they call it a window of tolerance. That every person has a window of tolerance that they can kind of like move in and work around and feel around in. And we know you can probably tell when something is a little outside that window of tolerance and don't push it. Don't push it without somebody who can really help you and guide you through that. Um, and there's probably some things that are totally within that window of tolerance. Like for me this morning, painful, but tolerable, you know, <laughs> like I could move through this process with some of those emotions that were coming up. Again, it's not fun, but it's not like completely overwhelming or disorienting. Whereas some places of trauma that I might hold might be. Yeah, great. And, you know, I think if people are looking for those resources, uh, regardless of what platform you're on, you can definitely shoot either of us a message. Um, we've had our fair share of individuals from all walks of life who are looking for professional resources, but also sometimes it's just helpful to have objective space, right? Your friends care about you, your families care about you, and the care that they provide for you might sometimes lend them to become too solution oriented, as opposed to being empathetic in their listening. And because they don't want you to hurt or have a problem, they will come to you and say, try this, do this, in their own emotional angst of not knowing what else to do, and it just doubles down versus you go to someone who's trained or even a space that allows for you to be comfortable because it's confidential and you can now self-express and begin to think about what you think about in a more controlled environment and then begin to process at a, at a pace that, that makes sense. Um, so I think if you want to walk people through the RAIN meditation and just again to reiterate, Meditation is something that no spiritual tradition owns, but you find it embedded within a variety of spiritual communities and walks of life, right? The idea of being able to introspect and contemplate, it's not done in a vacuum, but it's done upon something. And then here now, what's critical to understand is that you're not in a place where you're comparing yourself to anybody else. That's what society brings us to, a consumer-driven society, a supremacist society. It creates now these perspectives and prisms that render not an opportunity for a growth mindset, but a hesitation because there's always somebody who is happier than me or better dressed than me or does this better than me or that better than me. The meditation is not meant to be anything other than reflective. It's not meant to be self-deprecating, right? You are inward in your perspective so that who you are today can meet who you can potentially be tomorrow. And your default is not that you are a bad person, but as a good person, even a good person can be better in some capacity. What we're trying to do is figure out what's going on within us so that we can move forward to harness that contentment that any one of us is entitled to have access to. Um, and so I would strongly suggest that you engage as Yael is leading us through the meditation and to be a part of that, right? What we find quite honestly, like you see like tons of the same book written again and again on self-development, personal development, because people will read, but they won't execute upon it. You know, and you want to make yourself distinct. The first few times you do something, you're getting used to the process. But as you get used to the process, you're going to then be able to go through it more. And it's going to start to penetrate the parts of you inwardly that are going to then help yield what it is that you need and impact what's happening to you outwardly, right? So if we need something that's more platitudinal, right, the world inside of you is what's going to impact how you engage the world around you. You know, so you take care of your inner self so that you're able to then deal with what's taking place externally as best as you can. So actively participate in this short meditation. And then after we're gonna have a little bit of time for debrief and Q&A before we wrap up. But go ahead whenever you're ready, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so, you don't have to do anything fancy. You can just kind of find a comfortable seat, some way that you can sit where you can kind of drop in 
and feel what's happening inside of you. You're welcome to close your eyes, but if that's not comfortable for you, you can kind of keep them lowered. Give your shoulders a stretch, really arrive in. We've been throwing a lot of information at you and this is a chance to just check in with yourself. As you can see, I like to usually put a hand on my chest just to kind of like go inside. And sometimes I put a hand on my stomach. That might be helpful for you to see what's happening in this body in this moment. So you may feel a pretty strong emotion right now. You may not. If you don't feel a strong, difficult emotion, see if you can do a little recall. Try and bring yourself back to a place that you've been at, that you were at recently, so that you can have it fresh in your body and your mind of working with that difficult emotion. Because this is practice. This is about, you know, really drawing on this practice when you do feel these things, when they do come knocking. So I'll use my example. This morning, after I drop him off, and I go back to the car. And we want to just start with that R. What's there? What's present? It could be several emotions. It could be one strong emotion. I think for me, it was just this real powerful sadness, kind of like, I would maybe say grief. Grief was upon me. So for you, maybe just notice. And again, if this is, if there's a feeling that feels actually too much, don't go to that one. <laughs> go to one that feels like it's safe and okay to practice right now. And just notice, is, is there other things that are upon you that are present? Just notice what's here in addition to that difficult feeling or emotion and we don't need to solve anything we're going to move into the a for allowing it to be there allowing it to be there what does that feel like to soften to not try and push it away to not try and solve it to just allow it to be there In my case i'll say Grief is here. Grief is here in this moment. And I'm telling you, my mind wants to try and fix it. It wants to be like, well, but uh, this is just, this is not going to, this is going to, and I'm going to, you know, like try and argue my way out of it. I'm just going to start to pause and be like, it's okay. It's okay to feel it. It's okay to feel it. Just feel it. And then you notice where in the body do you feel it? And sometimes when I ask this question, people say, I feel it in my mind. What are you talking about? I just feel it in my brain. But most 99% of the time, we think thoughts. That happens in our brain, in our mind. But emotions are only emotions because they have some sensation attached to them. So you may it may be fleeting, it may be fast, but see if you can notice, is there something happening in the body? What is happening in the body when I am feeling this emotion? So for me, with that grief, ugh, it's like totally, right? Like something sitting on my chest, something sitting on my belly, it's a lot of weight. breathing and feeling, noticing, does it feel like it has a color associated? Is it moving? Is it still? We want to get as close as possible. We really want to be intimate with what is happening and allowing it to be there as hard as it is, as difficult as it is, as painful as it is. Sometimes just breathing helps. And 
And then we're going to move to that very soft eye, that inquiry. What's underneath this? Is there any other feelings underneath it, behind it, around it? Is this rooted in something that I want to look more at, question, understand? And we don't want to kind of live in the world of analyzing. We want to drop into the body and almost ask the body these questions. I know that sounds weird, it's uncomfortable or strange sometimes. But if the mind could solve our emotional problems, they would have already. M mind and thinking and analysis are terrible ways of working with emotions. They don't understand how they work. The body understands emotions. The body will tell you lots of information. So if I use my example again, what's happening? What's underneath this? I think the answer that comes up for me is just impermanence, change, love, really just love. Like I love my kids so much and just the distance as they get more distant from me, the, it breaks my heart. It feels like pain, painful. And so that also kind of makes me think like I'm grasping, I'm trying to hold on to something that is inherently impermanent. And that's, that's hard, that's sad, that's producing that grief. <sighs> Finally, the N, nourish. How can I do for myself right now? How can you support yourself in this moment feeling this emotion? It can be just as simple as like putting your hand on your chest, it's taking a deep breath, getting yourself a glass of water, sending yourself a love text as I did, <laughs> whatever it is. Ask, your, ask, your, ask the feeling, ask your body, ask this moment, what can I do? How can I support you as you sit and work through this difficult emotion? And that's the, that's the meditation, that's the practice. And I want to say that our minds are tricky. And sometimes when we learn this kind of thing, our minds might um, be like, okay, I did the rain thing and it didn't go away. So what next? How can I rain this feeling away? <laughs> or like, how can I meditate this feeling away? And just to kind of come back to the point that the feeling will come and go when it's ready. We can't force a feeling to go away the same way we can't force a feeling to come in, an emotion to come in. We just can be with it. We can try and take off the layer of suffering from the, the pain that we feel and really try and be with it and bring it to the light and find that clean pain out of that place of that dirty pain. So um, I hope that was helpful open for questions. I know we already are getting some. Um, and I think uh, Imam Khalid is also open for questions. Did you want to say anything before we go to Q&A? Uh, no, I think maybe just in the interest of time, we can get right into it. If people have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Instagram question box. Uh, you can put them in the Zoom question or in the chat box. Um, we had one just to start off with. It says, what advice do you have for couples who are navigating their own individual difficult emotions while also being conscious and accepting of their partner's difficult emotions, especially when it may conflict at times, i.e. one partner feels anxiety while the other feels anger? Do you want to go for it? very hard. Um, I read this thing the other day that said that when you're in a partnership or in a couple, um, we think that we're dealing with another person at the age that they are, you know, like I'm 40 and I would think that, you know, I'm dealing with my husband who's a little younger than me. And the truth is 
we're often, especially when we're triggered, we are actually dealing with somebody's 12 year old self or somebody's seven year old self. And that is a much different thing to deal with someone when they're in a state where they're locked in that younger version of them. To go to your beautiful example, it's like dealing with the elephant from the time when the elephant thinks it's still tied up. And that's how we walk around. And those younger versions of us are in us and are, are waiting to be healed and, and freed from that rope. And so, I mean, I, I guess my response would be, it's, it's very hard to really deal with something difficult in a couple if you're not really taking care of yourself and really like trying to be with your own process, what's happening for you so that you don't just push all of that stuff onto your partner. It's easier said than done. Very, very difficult. Um, one of uh, uh, the greatest teachers, I think of our time, um, a man named Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Buddhist master, he gave this guidance to couples, which is to say like, when you're in a really difficult place, you're in a fight, you're feeling a lot, you just say like, I need to, I love you. I need to tend to myself for a moment. I need to take care of myself for a moment. It's almost like you have a screaming baby in the room and you're trying to like have a rational conversation with somebody else. And that screaming baby is yourself when you're feeling triggered. And so the best that you can to really pick up that baby that's inside of you and take care of that baby and, you know, work your way th with the emotion and through the emotion. And then you go to the partner when you feel somewhat stabilized and you try and kind of make space for them and for what they're going through. And there is also no problem and no shame with couples counseling. Um, I think it's incredibly, incredibly helpful because it's so hard to work through this sometimes on your own. Yeah, great. Um, I think the only thing that I would add to that is that, uh, you know, you exist in different phases of a relationship as well. So now if you have an individual who I'm also, I'm turning 40 this year um, and, uh, you know, I, can retreat back to a younger version of myself when I'm experiencing something that becomes a heightened level of emotion. If I'm going back to a 20 year old version or a 15 year old version of myself, and this happens, right? I remember I was having an argument with a close friend of mine and I was extremely exhausted, super like stressed from all kinds of things going on. And you know, I'm blessed to have some close, deep relationships and friendships with people that allow for me to remove a lot of the kind of public facing roles and whatever. And so this person, we are just kind of going back and forth, but the exhaustion sets in. And now he's just kind of going and going and going. And I just want him to stop talking and stop talking. He just keeps talking and it's getting more and more. And then I was like, can you just stop? But then I called him by somebody else's name and he was so deeply embedded in what he was saying. He didn't notice. But when I said it in my head, I said to myself, what's going on? And this was a name of a person that I hadn't talked to in years. But now I was in a space as that sensory perception that's feeding into your physical self, right? Your emotional self that's not just rooted in an intellectual space. That Yale is talking about is going to take you back experientially, whether you're conscious of it or not, and can literally manifest in a place that you're channeling things. So if I'm now in that place and I add to it that I'm in a young phase in a relationship, right? I'm not 10 years into something or 20 years, but I'm just weeks, days, months into something. I'm still learning how to give and receive information. And some of that can be very difficult to manage when you have both unreasonable expectations of yourself and the other. Like you're going to make mistakes when you're talking to somebody and learning to communicate across and to have an aspiration 
that is perfection in the sense that I don't get upset. I'm not going to agitate someone or they're not going to get agitated or I don't ever want to see them at their worst or can only accept them when they're at their best. The idea is to still root things in respect and civility, right? And to remind yourself of the love that brought you together in the first place. If you get to a place where you're so incompatible, it doesn't make sense, then you make difficult decisions on that. But that sense of self-forgiveness becomes important because I can perpetuate now and deflect certain insecurities onto the other because I don't know how to deal with what's coming up, right? I could have flipped out on my friend because I didn't want to pretend like what I just had come out of my mouth actually happened. And I don't know how to respond to it. And it can really throw things off. And so that's where I think the couple counseling piece for having just an objective person in the middle that can help to navigate communication, that what did this really sound like to you when he said this? Or how did it feel when she responded in this way? So you're open to learning about a fully autonomous person that has their own frame of consciousness and doesn't exist within your psyche. So they're now receiving in their own personal capacity, inclusive of parts of themselves that they don't even know might be there necessarily. And it's all just like coming out in one moment of, uh, you know, expression, if, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, there's a question here that says, how do we break down anxiety feeling, uh, like a permanent state of mind after the pandemic? Um, and there was a bunch of questions that came up on Instagram, um, that have to deal with just anxiety, right? And I think, um, there's heightened levels of anxiety that many people are feeling, for a variety of reasons. Another question on Instagram had to deal with, how do I deal with anxiety in relation to uh, you know, frustration due to financial instability? Um, so maybe if you have any thoughts or comments just on dealing with anxiety um, itself, that might be, might be good too. Yeah, I mean, you're not alone. These are like high anxiety times and uh, it's brutal. It can be really brutal. And there's um, a lot, there is a lot of practices with regards to anxiety. Actually, I am running an entire workshop tomorrow, 8 p.m. Um, and I'll put my uh, information on, we'll probably send a follow-up email, but I'm doing an entire workshop just on working with anxiety because there's a lot of different practices that can help um different types of meditation and different types of like more involved practices so I, because we don't have time to get into all of them i think you can do this type of practice that i gave you today but there's also anxiety is of is often very physical it lives in the body and it can kind of like get very locked in a body and so some like small things, but that really are not small that you can do to work with anxiety of all kinds, financial, world. You know, on the one hand, there are really scary big things. Like I'm I'm not here to tell you that there's not that there's not stuff that is real to be afraid of. But the thing that anxiety does is it makes us believe that we can see the future. And we live inside of this imaginary future that we think we can see. And it robs us of what is happening now. And yes, it, it makes us like believe that we might be able to protect against these bad things. So step one is just noticing, doing that recognizing process of being like anxiety is present and it doesn't know. It doesn't know what's gonna happen down the way. It's just making things up. You know, like there's maybe there's some useful bit of information you can get like, I'm have financial worry, maybe I should do this thing to try and help that financial. And then after that, there's nothing you can do. And so once you're past the point of actually doing anything and you're just living in the anxiety, like step one is to just remind yourself, anxiety is imagination. That's it. It's your imagination of things that can go wrong. It's trying to protect you. It's trying to kind of make you think about it to give you a false sense of control. Then, 
in addition to meditation, to working it through, there's, um, if as best as you can move your body, stretch, move, go to the gym, run around the block, whatever it takes to kind of like let that blood flow because then anxiety just works really strongly in a still container. Number three, if you can do for other people, sometimes getting out of your own story and seeing who can I help? What can I do both from the framework of service, like formal service, community type service from the framework of justice or from the framework of just people in your life that could use a call or help or support because anxiety also tells you a story of lack and of scarcity and pushing on the other button to, to kind of like give to other people show, might show you that you actually have abundance to give. And the last thing I would say is, you know, just get, get sleep if you can, get water if you can, take care of your body, take care of your system, um, you know, talk to friends, get outside, try and move that energy as best as you can and come to my workshop tomorrow. It's free. <laughs> uh, we're going to definitely send out information about the workshop for tomorrow. If you registered through the zoom, um, if you're on Instagram, uh, you can just check out Yael's uh, Instagram page and there's info up there as well. And if you're watching on Facebook, um, you know, we'll try to circulate it on some of our social media on the IC social media um, so that you can access that as well. Um, just really quickly, the only thing that I would say is it's really hard to experience something like anxiety, especially if it gets to the place of uh, manifesting in some kind of anxiety attack or panic attack. And literally it's now just constricting your whole body, right? Like when we get trained to deal with people who have anxiety attacks, you know, a natural inclination when you see somebody really riled up is you want to go put your arms around them or console them. And a uh, first step that many of us are taught that deal with people like this is like, you don't want to come and kind of get somebody feeling more constrained because they're already feeling like so tight. Um, consequently, now, as you come down from something that's episodic or you just let out all of this you know, anxiety or anger and things are bursting out, um, you have to deal with the fact that you live through it, right? And you can really get in your head and start building upon that feeling in a way that just creates a lot more self-loathing. There's something wrong with me. You know, I'm so embarrassed. This happened in front of people. People know these things about me. And the place of having a sense of self-compassion and self-forgiveness is very critical so that you're now not just creating more of those core beliefs that we talked about. They're all not rooted in childhood. They can build up even after the fact. And it perpetuates itself that you become so wary of not wanting to experience what you experience at a heightened level that it creates like a panic or anxiety attack that it now creates so much anxiety and it yields one of these things. And you don't know how to make sense of it and it just keeps going and going. And that ability to just take a step, take it a day at a time, allow for yourself to bring rest and relaxation back in. So there's kind of a loosening and those elements of outlets that are gonna literally untie these knots, right? You're doing the stretching, you're doing the exercise, you're going at a pace that makes sense for you you're going to start to just feel it diminish in yourself. And then after the fact, you want to try to make critical sense of it, right? Not while you're going through it and you're experiencing it. Somebody is having like a lot of anger. You don't want to try to go into a space of making them rationalize it in the moment. If you now are in a space where you're dealing with yourself, you can't in the moment try to rationalize when the parts of you that are dictating perspective and decision making are in a state of emotional angst. And you're going to then perceive yourself through that emotion. And it's not going to end in a good place. 
right? Because it feels that way. You feel the heaviness. Think about it if it was an actual like prism or vision manifest in like glasses of some kind, right? You're seeing yourself through that. So you give yourself some days to rest and then you allow for yourself to look back and be like, what happened? Right. And there's complexity to us. All of us is connected to the rest of us. So we likely don't yield something just from one catalyst, but there's multiple things like Yale is talking about, you know, your physical wellness, your eating habits, your sleeping habits, what's work like, what are other stresses? And if you have like you're running kind of on threads because it's already super stressful, and then something heavy comes that you have the unfortunate loss of you know, a loved one, you lost a job, a relationship is going sour. Those are heavy experiences on their own, let alone when everything is suffocating or super stressed out, it's just going to be that much more burdensome in, in the moment. Um, and, but again, to go back to my initial point, a lot of these are just indicators, right, that we can pay attention to. Your spirit, your heart, your body is going to tell you if something is off. And when you have now this kind of response, you don't have to name it right in the onset. You can take time to just get back to a place of stability and then try to figure it out. Even if every inclination is like, I need to make sense of this now, you don't, right? Because there's a good chance a lot of days will pass and you still didn't make sense of it. So you might as well just try to enjoy those days. And when you're in a place that you feel more rested, you look back and now with a different sense of I'm at homeostasis, I don't know what this is in my hand. Sorry, it just kind of popped up on my finger. But when you're in a place of homeostasis, you are able to look back with a little bit more of a presence of who you actually are. And it's not the anxiety that's making that determination. Um, I want to be mindful of time. And Yale, maybe you can do one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, this was relevant, I think, to the practice where somebody asks, what is the next step to processing when the introspective RAIN meditation practice leads to increased feelings of resentment or regret? It's a really good question. And actually, I noticed that others are sort of talking about kind of asking kind of similar things of, okay, so I'm feeling this thing. Now what? You know, how does that, how do we move that? How do we deal with that? Um, and resentment and regret are their own little presents that have things inside of them. There's 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 stories inside that you know may be rooted in real pain or real sadness. There's often lots and lots of stuff underneath. There might be stories that got rooted really young that don't serve you anymore, and there might be real terrible things that happen that are in there. And that's the case with almost anything that like when we get close, when we really investigate some of this stuff, it's multi-layered. This is not, you know, something that we are one and done. This is like a lifelong process of coming more into our humanity by going closer and closer to these, this part of ourselves as humans. Somebody said, Why do you, how do you define well-being? And I think I don't, I got, you know, God willing, we never get to a place where we don't feel anything. That's not life. That's not living. When we open up the switch to feeling the hard things and being willing to like let the hard things move through us, then it's that same switch that lets us experience the vitality of life and experience real love and real connection and intimacy. There's only one switch. It's either open or it's closed. And so, um, so, you know, I know that's not a, a very quick or easy answer, but it's it's a process. Um, and I'm, you know, anybody that would like to kind of go deeper in this stuff with me, in addition to the workshop I'm doing tomorrow, um, I am just launched a 12 week long um, group coaching program called Flourish. And I'll send you all the information, but we meet live weekly every week for 12 weeks. It has guided meditations that take us along the path to really do this work of moving closer to what is happening inside of you, to working with what's happening inside of you, to examining your narratives 
and to opening up into the larger truth of who you really are. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll maybe see some of you there or in other places over time. And um, I want to thank you all so much. And thank you for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but hopefully in other places and other times. And thank you um, to ha uh, Hannah and the Islamic Center for doing the moderation and to you, Khalid, for being such a great friend and such a wonderful colleague. So much fun to do these with you. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I don't know if you want to just throw maybe some contact into the chat box um, for people who are here. If you registered for the Zoom, um, we'll be sending out just information also on ways that you can be in touch with Yael um, on the program tomorrow as well. Uh, and you can find it on her Instagram and her social media handles, I think, are all Yael Shy One, um, the number one. So Yael Shy, her name, and the number one. Uh, and you'll be able to jump in on that. It's really important um, to engage in these kinds of practices. You know, we're in a space constantly where we're running from here to there. And you don't wanna think about this as something that is just, I know it, but you want to aspire towards being able to have the wisdom to act upon it, right? Because all of us can know something, but it, is a select few who seek to then seek to do something about it. You don't wanna operate on default settings, right? And the goal is to not just simply stifle difficult emotions and to stifle anxiety or sadness and anger or try to reconcile how to deal with those. But the goal is to get to a place where we're feeling more of contentment and balance, right? And not in spite of our humanity, you're gonna feel sad. It's a very human emotion. You're going to feel down and you should, right? That's how we're wired. That's what we're made. But to still have balance inwardly that we're able to move forward, have an emotional recovery that makes sense, have the ability to harness these emotions and to create empathy for others who are around us. Um, and so you want to build deliberately into your routine uh, the opportunity to start a process like this. And I'd heavily recommend you go to the workshop Yael is doing tomorrow. If you have the capacity and means to do the program she's doing, the Flourish program, to take advantage of that as well. Uh, we're really trained to just deal with things external, but become fairly unfamiliar when it has to deal with now taking care of the most precious parts of us, which is within us. Um, so please do check it out. And thank you again, Yael, for being with us. So a couple of quick announcements uh, before we wrap up. Um, for those of you who have been in the process of signing up to regain access to um, our facilities at the Islamic Center as guests, as visitors, uh, one, if you haven't done that and you're anticipating coming to the Center for Ramadan programs, um, we'd recommend that you do that sooner than later. Uh, we've already had a lot of people, I'm not gonna quote the number, I don't want to freak people out, um, but a lot of people have requested access. Uh, and if there's a flood of interest going into Ramadan, uh, it's still going to take about five days for the approval process to happen. So you don't want to wait till the first day, and then you're going to have to wait till the beginning of the second week, potentially, of Ramadan. So fill out the interest form. Um, Hannah just posted it in the chat box. Uh, we'll then take the next step of inputting your information and you'll get an email from NYU Campus Safety asking you to upload uh, proofs of vaccination, et cetera. Um, and once all that's done and approved, they'll send you a link to a screener that has to show a green approved sign before you can enter the facility. And there's not really any room around that. Uh, so please do take advantage of that. Um, and do it as soon as you can. Uh, we're gonna need volunteers and we're gonna be raising funds for various charity initiatives as well. Um, so hope to see you all there. Uh, and if any of you need anything at all, feel free to be in touch and to reach out. Um, I don't respond to messages on social media. Um, it just becomes very difficult to keep up with it there, but you can shoot me an email. You can reach out to us through the Islamic Center 
at info at icnyu.org. And that's whether you're in New York or not. Um, we don't want people to feel alone. And if this conversation is bringing up stuff for you and you need any kind of assistance, uh, feel free to reach out. And I know Yale would be comfortable with me saying the same on her behalf. Um, if we are not able to directly do something for you, we definitely will do our best to refer you to resources we have in our networks so that you're able to get what it is you need and, and move forward. Um, but thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you again, Yael. Uh, inshallah, we'll see everyone soon. Have a good night. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Take care. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org slash donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.